Okay. Uh, shall we get started? Stavrula, Matt, we're ready to go? Go. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. So I want to welcome everybody to the Student and uh, Early Career Networking Research Roundtable. This is uh, another one of our continuing series of uh, networking channel events. My name is Jim Carosa. Uh, my name is Matt Caesar from University of Illinois. Great. And we're going to be the host today. Um, this is going to be, um, we haven't we haven't done this before on the networking channel, but you know, a lot of times we talk about what's the future of networking research. A lot of times we talk about the technical topics there, but when you think about it, so much is driven by the people. Um, and so we thought it'd be a really great idea to bring together some early career researchers really from around the world. Um, and really just have an open discussion uh, with these folks. Matt and I have a couple of questions uh, for starters, and uh, we've got a group of uh, five people here uh, who we think are really going to be great. Matt? Yeah, so uh, we've brought them together today to uh, have a conversation about uh, what drew them to the field, You know, what's gonna sustain them over time and throughout their careers. And uh, you know, talk about how the the field itself needs to advance to enable their vision of the future to materialize. And so, uh, we're very lucky uh, and pleased uh, to be able to listen in on this conversation. Um, and so, to get started, we would like to ask each of the panelists to uh, briefly introduce themselves, beginning with uh, Rachi Singh. And Matt, maybe maybe just one second before we get started with the introductions. You see everybody here. Uh, just a couple of notes just about um, about this particular event. So the, the event's going to last for, for, for one hour. Um, there's a chat window that's available to people if you want to make comments there. Uh, remember, everything you say there will go to everyone, if it, unless it's directed just to the panelists. There's also a question and answer uh, button in the bottom, just a little bit to the right of the middle, that you can use to pose questions that you'd like to have the panelists discuss. Um, and then after this event, uh, there's a continuing discussion, as we always do in the networking channel, there's a continuing discussion that'll happen on the Slack channel. And uh, Stavrula will post the Slack channel uh, location. For the, okay, so with that as starters, uh, we're going to get going. Uh, you can see we've got a fabulous group of, of young researchers from five different countries and four different continents. Here we want to thank them before we even get going for participating and, and sharing their thoughts with us. So why don't we just go around, uh, maybe we'll start at the top left-hand corner of the slide that we see here, um, and just we're going to have short self-introductions. So Rachie, you want to go first? Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for joining this morning. I am Rachi Singh. I have just started as an assistant professor of computer science at uh, at Cornell. I am a networking researcher, like all of us here, a large number of us here. Uh, but I focus on uh, optical interconnects of you know various types in my research. Okay, Mina. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Jim and Matt, for organizing this and for having us. I'm really excited. Um, so I'm Mina. I am an assistant professor at University of Waterloo, um, and I started in July, so also pretty new. Um, and I, I am also an working researcher, but my focus is mostly on programmable networks um, in kind of everything in it from, you know, languages, compilers, hardware verification. Um, yep. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Devil Pong. Hey, hi everyone. Um, I'm Debopam. I'm a senior researcher at Microsoft Research India. Uh, I earned my PhD degree in systems and networks from ETH Zurich in 2021. Uh, my research focuses a lot on low latency networks, network design, and my PhD thesis focused on uh, you know low Earth orbit satellite networks to a large degree. So happy to chat more on uh, all of these and beyond. Hi everybody. I'm I'm Jefferson. Uh, I'm from the uh, I'm um, adjunct professor at the Federal University of the State of Rio. So we know it here as UniHiu. Uh, and my my research it focuses on network science and stochastic graph models in in general. Okay. And Arash. Hi 
Hello, everyone. My name is Arash, and I was muted earlier. I just realized. Um, uh, yeah, I lead. Uh, I'm a group leader, and I currently lead um, virus communication and sensing lab, and that's essentially my research. So I work on um, a wireless networking, communication, resource allocation, and scheduling problem, and also building systems, software-defined radios, and prototyping. Okay. Great. So we've got a, a, a great group of people here from really all around the world and representing a lot of the breadth of the networking field itself. So um, Matt, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, one of our goals is to kind of keep this informal and kind of have it be a conversation. We wanted to open up the discussion uh, to the audience. If you have, you know, questions or topics you'd like to see discussed, you know, please put them in the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, but to kind of kick things off, we wanted to start the discussion with a, with a particular question um for the panelists and the the question is kind of about your uh your relationship to the future of networking so that you know there's this question of you know what will happen in the future of uh networking and in particular we're curious about uh what what your motivations are you know is there anything about what motivated you to pursue networking research that uh that might inform how we might think about the future of networking that's kind of a, a question um that we had for you all. Um, I, I I could take this one if if uh, if that's okay, and then maybe we'll, we'll move on. So um, for for me, I I got interested in uh, in networking research um, during my undergrad. I started doing an internship with what then used to be a young startup called Arista Networks. Um, and I, I did an internship there, and it's a person who had just taken like one class in networking. I, I just, it was, I was, I was like, I was a fish out of water for, for a long time. I was just implementing uh, routing protocols on switches. And I just, I was like, man, this is so hard. Uh, I remember people would expect, um, you know, interns to write tests, for example. And I remember the first time configuring a switch and realizing I cannot get this right. I do not know how in the world anyone is configuring these devices, like ever. Um, and maybe five years later, I learned there are people who are yeah, the researchers who do verification and they, they do this work um, and they, they figure out how should we configure things correctly and stuff like that. But back when I started, I was just like, this is so hard. I want to learn more. Um, and that's that's sort of how I got started uh, with, with networking research and really got getting interested in wanting to just learn more about it. I'm going to follow up on that because I think the complexity was was something that actually intrigued me a lot too. It was I took the course in undergrad and I was like, so many things have to work well together for this to work. Um, and I it was just that the nature of the thing was distributed. It seemed it seemed really difficult to get it right. And I think I was intrigued to kind of uh, look at it more. And I, I think the more I learned, I realized it is even more complex than what I thought. <laughs> Um, and I feel like that's one of the big challenges ahead of us, right, uh, to try to figure out uh, how to manage that complexity. And I think that is one thing that is motivating, for, uh, definitely motivating for me for my research to kind of figure out ways to uh, uh, practically uh, try to manage that kind of complexity. Mm -hmm. um, maybe while you are in undergrad, I had the same experience, but uh, I was attracted to networking, not because of the complexity, I must admit. Uh, networking was an elective, I, my, I majored in electronic uh, engineering, and networking was an elective course I took out of curiosity, and somehow it just made sense in the class for me. I, that's where I developed interest, and after was basically during master and PhD, I continued along that line. Um, it was appealing for no reason I can describe that. <laughs> So if you ask me what motivates me, um, uh, you know, um, I would say um, the, the interesting problems that we could solve, right? So, um, um, you know, when it comes to networks, the internet, people talk about, you know, applic different application and application performance. So this is this is very important to solve, right? To uh, understand what uh, impacts user experience and to, you know, design your networks, design your solutions so that you can offer good user experience across different applications. But I think more importantly, it's about bridging the digital divide, right? So uh, when I was a school uh, student, right, I missed uh, access to the internet. I did have very limited access to Wikipedia or YouTube videos and tutorials, right? There were cyber cafes uh, in our locality, in our city. 
and those were you know uh, costly business so you had to pay a couple of bucks shed uh, some money in order to get access to the internet and that was time cap service with very limited bandwidth but you know while i was growing up i went to college i could see that you know the uh, it, the connectivity slowly started improving and that greatly empowered the human race uh, in, in india in our uh, society it was having a huge huge impact so that actually motivated me because i thought that a lot is yet to be achieved right so I'll, if we if, if we see today even today almost 40% of the global population is yet to be connected to the internet uh, and a large fraction of people live very far away from uh, optical fiber cables so how do we connect them how do we empower them so that's a big question that actually motivates me to do uh, networking research mm -hmm. A very interesting that Deborah mentioned the digital divide because I, in a sense, uh, uh, my, my first uh, uh, works in networking student back, back in my undergraduate years were uh, in, in that same vein, you know, working on, uh, on on the level of applications, the case, uh, working with uh, video transmissions, was working actually on a system that was used to, you know, broadcast uh, uh, video lectures to uh, students across the state in, in uh, faraway places where they couldn't get easy access to the internet, where they couldn't easily, uh, you know, move to a, a university to study there, and so they still could get their diplomas and everything. Uh, but in a sense, I kind of deviated from the technology itself and went to work on more abstract and more general models. Uh, I think, in a sense, also because of the applications, because of the potential to um, act actually you know uh, find new applications with the same body of knowledge that we, we come to develop and discover and consolidate doing that uh, research in a more uh, modeling aspect in a more uh, general uh, representation method so I, I think that's uh, interesting how the same motivation can actually uh, drive us to you know different points of, of view or different focuses on our research yeah, you know, that's, that's, it's really interesting. Um, sometimes when I take like the super big view of networking, I think of, well, there's sort of three phases or three sort of broad things that people think about. You think about the artifact that we build, you think about the systems and the scale, and then you think about the people who use them. And I think among the five of you, I can put at least one of you, you know, the motivating factor in one of those, those three different categories. Actually, I'm curious, um, and, and, and maybe you're all junior enough that uh, uh, you you haven't shifted or, you know, from one to another, but do you feel like as you've gotten started, your your interests have broadened or, ch or changed? Maybe Jefferson, that was true for you. I guess you mentioned that a little bit. Yeah, that certainly was the case. I, I started more on the application side, but still on networking more uh, on the technology side per se, and I moved towards, um, network science, which is network more in, in name and modeling than necessarily on uh, the application itself or the, the context of usage uh, itself. But uh, I still think that uh, uh, networking uh, is able to feed from that in terms of solutions and also to bring problems, new problems to solve. And uh, I think that what actually brought me to network science was not necessarily to get away from uh, networking research. I've been uh, collaborating on a couple of topics on uh, 5G networks and stuff like that, on um, uh, blockchain. And, but uh, I think uh, the the actual value of the, the research path that I took is actually to kind of aggregate new kinds of knowledge from fields that you wouldn't even uh, think about in advance that they would have a, a connection uh so ideas and, and ways of thinking from like uh, uh, sociology or from economics or from biology that can actually bring ideas that you can explore in totally new ways and that so i think there's a sort of uh symbiosis here that we can have between uh these kind of uh, philosophies and, and research in uh, in actual networking topics so uh i i would never say i would i Came, I, I, I driven afar from networking. I just put a step to, to the side to actually bring more things into it, I would say that. I'm, I'm actually wondering if it's possible now to just do networking. I actually don't think so. 
I, I mean, like you went up application layer. Uh, my story is a bit different. I started networking, then then it got then I got to Mac layer uh, resource allocation. <laughs> We look at the systems, you want to be in the system, you need software defined radios if you work on wireless systems, that means physical layer knowledge. And now I talk to people who design antennas and basically are are working on electromagnetics. So um, I personally find it extremely exciting to get into a room with the people of the same faculty, you speak the same language and it takes you half an hour to understand each other. <laughs> um, this is very, very exciting personally, but uh, apart from that, I've been thinking for a long time that I don't think if it's simply possible to do networking, maybe it's, maybe it's because networking has advanced so much uh, or the systems are becoming more and more integrated in a way that you cannot just take this layer and this piece off and say, well, I'm going to work on this small problem. You need to have the knowledge of upper and lower layers to be able to do something meaningful. Um, and I'm actually curious if if, if some of you uh, could point to a problem where, I mean, it reduces our headache, right? So that you don't need to go to different disciplines and understand what's going on there. No, uh, Arash, I, I completely sense. agree to what you said, right? I mean, um, uh, even if we consider networking, it's kind of a it's kind of a beast, right? With all these different layers doing different things. Uh, and and uh, I see my collaborators, uh, fellow researchers in the field having expertise in, you know, particular layers or a set of layers, right? So it really, in our field, uh, in networking systems kind of research, it's very important that we collaborate really with different people uh, because they have different sort of expertise across the layers, right? So all the way up from the applications down to the uh, physical layer. So I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I, I echo what you said. It's not easy to just work on a particular layer or something very specific. We need more, like we need broader view than that and uh, larger challenges to tackle. And then that might impact the way uh, we do all these different layers. Like, I mean, you have to tackle the problem at different layers or maybe co-design layers at some point. This, this kind of uh, reminding me of things we teach uh, or, or have learned in, in networking classes, you know, layering and modularity is important, but then it comes at the cost of, you know, sometimes you do want to, uh, you, you, you want to cross layering boundaries because that gives you something that's more optimal. So these cross layer uh, system designs, algorithm designs can bias, um, you know, we, we are trading off the modularity to get something in return. And, and I think we all have to, at some point, you know, do that in our uh, in our research and, and this is also something we teach uh, in, in in intro to networking stuff i'm learning as we speak <laughs> yeah i just want to add that i think i i think that also holds kind of at the broader scale like along the uh kind of the topics that jim was mentioning and i think i agree i don't think you can do any of them in isolation anymore so i think personally i'm have been more interested in the artifact uh like the network itself but um i think i'm kind of going more towards help like you can't think about it without help thinking about the systems which is the applications that are using it i think at this point you, you really need to think about what are the applications that are using my network and can i kind of customize my network the artifact to, to help them and also the people that use them i think both in terms of the uh, maybe operators engineers who are actually using the network and i think there's a lot of help that still is needed there uh, to kind of manage that complexity and also kind of, as many of you pointed out, people that are using the network, because it's not, you know, just a scientific experiment or something that is just uh, experts have to interact with, you know, more and more, um, you know, I think a lot of more people from very different backgrounds and different kind of uh, kind of knowledge have to interact with it. And I, I think that's kind of exciting and something that I've been kind of looking forward to seeing more on or try to get involved in, but it's hard because I think it crosses into HCI even, or, you know, kind of, um, application layer and, you know, exciting as Arash was saying in the sense that you have, you know, you, you're going to have to have different kinds of people with different backgrounds in the room, but definitely challenging. Mm -hmm. for sure. um, yeah, you know, when you, you, you... go ahead. Uh, no, uh, actually, uh, as you mentioned, like, uh, at least uh, Mina mentioned, I remember at the beginning that the, you, you like networking because it was complex. Um, now it has got a significant divorce. And the question is, why should somebody start doing networking research? If if you end up in a different layer, it's going to be like significantly more challenging. Why not a different field? I mean, if, if you have to convince someone uh, to do networking research. 
um, how do you convince them? So, so, so are you are you suggesting, Arash, that that you would want to shy away from the field because it's complex and hard, or um, so in the end, students. I mean, de de depending on the. I mean, I'm not talking about researchers because typically researchers very often they follow interest, um, not necessarily complexity. But when you talk about the students, uh, we have master bachelor courses designed around this. How do you motivate them to go to communication networking instead of I don't know, doing mechanical engineering or material sciences? I mean, like uh, why this? Right or or AI maybe right? Uh -huh. uh, I, 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 that I think everybody is doing a bit of that. Even machine learning people are a bit pissed about that because there's no room for them to do their research anymore. I, I sure. think the Paul Erdős uh, approach is is interesting. No, Paul Erdős, he used to consider mathematics uh, a social activity. I don't think why we should we couldn't see networking as a social activity as well. You know, we just bring people from different expertise together, and that's work. That's part of the job. And I think that that would be a, actually a, a a healthy way to think about it. I mean, I think I'm glad you brought it up because I think I'm starting to worry about that. <laughs> you know, I think. Uh, this kind of past six, seven months of the kind of the faculty life, I think it made me come out of that bubble that I was a part of maybe during my PhD and postdoc of all the people that love networking, cared about networking, knew, you know, what's going on, right? Why we care about everything. And now I'm talking with undergraduate students or trying to recruit students and get them excited to kind of continue their graduate studies. And I think the complexity is, is I, I still find it really fun. I think, I think it's great. And it means that there are a lot of exciting problems to work on, but I, I, I feel like maybe as a community, we need to kind of at least clarify that there's some directions that we're working on, you know, some broader mm -hmm. directions that we're working on, and then be able to present that to people from the outside, right, to help them not feel like they're just going to come in and get lost in a sea of papers and all these complex things that, you know, it's hard to make sense of and, you know, know kind of how to make progress on them. And I think that's something that I'm personally worried about, and I, I feel like as, as a community, we can do a better job of that too, you know. But what I would have really liked to be able to say is that, you know, here are, I don't know, 10, 10 big directions that as a community we're working on. Mm -hmm. And here are the, this is the progress we've made so far. And here are the next big things that are left to do, right? And I think it's there, right? Like if you've been in the community for, I don't know, many years and, you know, been to conferences, talk to people, to panels, you, you have that, but to try to crystallize that for someone from outside, I don't think it's the one person job. <laughs> and I don't think we have a lot of resources in our community um, for that. And I'm just gonna end that <laughs> with saying, I think the network verification committee is doing something really cool. I think uh, Ratul Mahajan and Ryan Beckett created this kind of web, like, uh, uh, website, netverify.fun, which does that for network verification. And I've mm -hmm. been using that, I've been introducing that to people, but I feel like we can do a lot more of that. To, for the people from outside to start to get interested and see what we're doing. Right, you know, that that that's something that I think is really important for a field to be able to, you know, there, there's there's so much work going on. And uh, as Arash said, it's, it's, it's such, networks are such complicated systems, but be able to pull out the 10 themes like you mentioned, Mina. So here are sort of 10 intellectual directions. So one might be, you know, correctness of systems at scale and verification, for example, which in my mind is something that's sort of flown naturally out of SDN, the ability to start thinking about those kinds of problems even and do things. But great point of would be really nice to sort of have that lift. I lost uh, Jim. Another question. Uh, just to move on uh, in, in the discussion here. Uh, so you're all new uh, and, and, and are new to uh, uh, academic and research life in industry. Something that I think many of us who've been in there for a longer time, sometimes you sort of forget what it's like and what's hard and what easy about being a um, well, the roadblocks that you see, if you see things that are, have been really easy or surprise easy for you, 
what do you see as the challenges for you? Not so much the intellectual challenge and the research problem that you're looking at, but more working in beyond getting data or whatever the challenges might be in the research itself, as opposed to the research problem. Um, so I, I can I can start. Um, so I think something that uh, I, I would like that I think is a challenge, and I think we can take inspiration from other fields of uh, of computer science in doing better at those challenges, is the existence of really good benchmarks. So sort of how, and these could be you know hardware benchmarks, these could be uh, software benchmarks, these could be data set benchmarks that. Uh, were sort of, you know, standard for networking research that whenever we build a system or whenever we try to move the needle on something, they are, you know, the, the evaluation section is, you know, we, we know what to do. We know how to evaluate and concretely say that we've moved the needle indeed. Like, for example, I see machine learning people have a very good set of benchmarks that they tend to do on, you know, model blah, on the data set blah, did, you know, better by this much percent and why we care about that. So I think that is something I sorely missed. I think we almost redefine benchmarks for every system and problem. And that makes it hard as a student to evaluate stuff that makes it hard as a researcher to zoom out and compare uh, different different approaches to solving a problem. So that's something I, I think is is a challenge. And I wish we could we could come up with a better way of uh, of doing this. So, Roshi, that's a bit of a community culture, right? I mean, uh, I, I realized exactly what you said. Like, I think six months ago, for some reason, I was reading through a couple of uh, proceedings of machine learning conferences. You have the code, um, you have the data set. You run the code, the code runs. <laughs> um, now, going, let's say, in my smaller community systems, like very often we have open source codes available, and that includes me, myself. Um, I know if you don't have that specific version of a specific software that works with that specific kernel of Linux, you would never ever be able to replicate that. Um, I would try to document it as much as I can, but in the end, um, that's the problem. But on top of that, there are people who basically develop something uh, and the code is never shared. You contacted them, you contact them regarding the details. You never get an answer. Um, so did you see, I think, a little bit of the community culture at the moment that is slowly, I think, changing, but maybe too slow. Yeah, actually, maybe I'll ask Matt, because I know SIGCOM, uh, the organization, the SIG, has wrestled with this issue of repeatability and rep replicability. But maybe one thing I'll note is I know NSF, uh, um, uh, Richie, NSF has done a couple of workshops on measurement and, that have been and, um, maybe on the um, Slack channel. I can post some of the reports that came out, but I, exactly these kinds of issues that you're that you're talking about have been been discussed there. You know, as really important challenges for the field. I don't know, Matt. My sense is there's there are things going on or discussions going on about repeatability and. Um, uh making code available for example i think so yeah it's 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 definitely something we need to do a lot more on but i think there's some kind of early efforts around kind of you know creating data sets collecting data sets together that could be used for for uh maybe maybe for benchmarking you know kind of getting those up in common places and uh getting people to contribute data uh data sets maybe that'd be a very early step in that direction but yeah we need we need to do a lot more uh <laughs> but, but i think Part of the problem, Matt, is that the big conferences, um, they don't value data sets that much. Uh, while it takes significant effort. I think like two years ago, um, we were planning um, to do a massive uh, measurement, uh, which I think we spent like six months prepare in preparation and everything. And in the end, we reached out to some people in the TPC of one of the very good conferences where we thought, well, if we, if I, if we put this much effort, we would like to see that outcome. And they were like, yeah, to be honest, data sets, very hard to publish unless you have a nice algorithm on top. And I was like, well, I mean, this just takes, like I, we cannot put another one year to complete this. And in the end, basically put it in a workshop or somewhere. So the community also seems to not really value it apart from conferences, I guess, like IMC. 
So let me uh, try to answer um, Jim's uh, question, right? I mean, what are some non, uh, you know, technical or research challenges? So um, I simply hope the internet does not become a giant black box, right? With few big players using their proprietary protocols and infrastructure to drive a large chunk of uh, the traffic, right? The more open the internet remains, the better. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll tell you about my experience. When I started uh, working on these low Earth orbit satellite networks, um, at that point, you know, SpaceX has uh, had only deployed two of their satellites, and I could not find anything, any tool to work with. Uh, I started digging into the SCC filings, ITU filings, and then eventually I started building my own simulator. But you know, I mean, simulators are a good starting point. But beyond that, you need the right tools, the right infrastructure to run your experiments on to understand these. Uh, these large uh, future networks. So on that, I think what's happening right now is there is a gap between how the industry works and how the academic research community works. Um, there are some big players here with their proprietary networks and protocols, and then the academic community is trying to address by you know building their own simulation simulators and emulators. I think here there is a scope that they work together more closely, collaborate more closely. Because on one hand, we have the data, we have the right infrastructure to run our experiments on. On the other hand, we have very deep research expertise. I mean, 30 years or 25 years or even more take years of expertise in systems and network design and network uh, like protocol design and all. Right? If we could marry them, right, that would be great. I mean, because these, these networks are going to drive a lot of a large chunk of the internet traffic in the future. So it's very important that we come together and try to address some some problems here, right? So, uh, so on that, uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to do some community building uh, here. Uh, I'm going through a couple of efforts in 2021. I organized Leocon uh, to bring industry and uh, academic community closer together. Uh, last year, I organized Leocon 2022 again as a one-day tutorial co-located with Mobicom. So, one thing I'd quickly like to advertise is that. Me with my collaborators from University of Surrey, uh, Professor Nishant Shastri and his team, we are organizing a Leocon webinar series. Uh, this has just started. So every uh, two months or so, we'll invite notable speakers, uh, at least one from the industry and one from the academic community, so that you know we could find the right synergies and work together on some of the problems. So please feel free to join some of these. Please join hands, and we could discuss more. So Debopal, maybe one thing we could ask you is to post some information about that uh, either in the uh, the chat here or, or in, in the Slack conversation afterwards. That would be great. Sure, sure. I'll do that. You know, and also just in terms of resources and this notion of bringing together the community to share information, you know, that's something that MLab, and we've, we've, we've had a couple of speakers who've been associated with MLab and talked a little bit about it in the past as an organization that's trying to do something similar. Um, I just wanted to add kind of to having, so what was said about having, you know, kind of these benchmarks and, um, you know, data sets that everybody uh, kind of agrees on. I think uh, it goes a little bit even deeper because I think sometimes we even rewrite simulators. I don't think as a community, we even kind of have this shared simulator or, you know, kind of unifying infrastructure that everybody evaluates on top of, you know, so I think every page, sometimes every paper you look at, they have their own kind of simulator that they've optimized for certain kind of things or, uh, their own set of servers and test beds and of course the information is in the evaluation section they say what kind of servers but it just makes it so difficult to compare things right because not everybody can go and have every kind of type of server and you know try to get everything to run so i think um even and i don't know how to get started on that honestly to try to convince everybody that this is this is a simulator that is good enough for everybody to use and it's okay if you know, of course, if you do your own simulator, you may be able to optimize some things, but let's just use this and, you know, kind of all have this same uh, kind of infrastructure to compare things. So I think that's a big challenge. Um, and I, I personally just don't know how to how to solve that. I think being it's true that we're becoming kind of more open and, you know, there's like artifact evaluation committees that try to make sure artifacts exist. But if the artifacts are still so different from each other and we don't have those same kind of set of infrastructure or simulators or benchmarks, then we're still kind of facing that challenge of trying to figure out if you're making progress, which are the parts that we're not making progress on, how do we then compare um, work uh, with each other? So 
Um, yeah, I was not sure what to do about that. <laughs> so, so, so Mina, um, I, I guess th th there are moves afoot in open source communities to really want to do that. And sometimes it's the system software itself, but sometimes certainly in other fields, it's software that's used for evaluation that you mentioned, you know, in fields even outside of computer science. Um, and that um, government organizations sometimes support those kinds of efforts. So the open source community might be a place to actually look for that. I think the models though, for how you support that and how you keep something up to date, right? And, and have it production ready for the community to use is still a real challenge. I think the only successful example we have at the moment is NS3, right? Which right. Uh, if, if, if we have all used it, we all agree it's also not really great. <laughs> Um, but that I don't think I've but, seen but, papers but, rewrite their own simulator. Like even NS3 is right there, you know, there's a great community around it, but I still see people just I completely it. understand because I've had friends during a PhD and students afterwards who spent six months, seven months trying to implement functionalities that they didn't they couldn't. So uh it, it is a complex piece of software. Um sometimes it works for certain things, it simply just doesn't work. Um because it doesn't scale, for example, if you're working on larger networks, that happens. Like you run simulations for weeks and you might not get something you want. But um, I personally truly wondered if, if that is a possibility. But um, as Jim said, um, open source community is the only way. I do, but I guess it's just not enough because there's so much time the, the open source community can put into building these complex simulators. I mean, I've yeah, seen NST, other fees. Is the, uh, NST is the best bet, right? But I have heard this argument like, oh, okay, this is on NST, but what about the internet? There are so many corner cases, <laughs> so many things that could break, right? Uh, imagine someone writing a protocol on top of NST and then going to IETF to, and ask to standardize, right? So that is not going to happen. Um, so I think, I, I, I mean, it, it makes sense probably to come up with uh, data-driven simulators. So we could run measurements at scale, like uh, over the internet or over specific networks, understand what are the corner cases, how things work in general, what are the things that break, and then maybe feed in that information, that data to simulators to make them more matched. I don't know how to achieve that, but you know that could be some interesting thing to explore. I want to drive this discussion quickly to a, a slightly different direction because I, I don't know if I'm speaking only for Brazil or for, I don't know, maybe South America, but uh, I think there are uh, a, a lot of uh, difficulties on handling research around here in a more systematic uh, manner that I think are strongly related to actually to, to personnel matter in a sense. Uh, so in, uh, in one side, uh, usually the you know, the teaching research in, in, in Brazil is the main one for any, any person who's in the, in the academic side of things and not in the industry. And so, um, and actually, actually, usually professors, they're expected to do a lot of different things at once. So you have to teach uh, your eight hours a week of classes. You have to do your research. You have to actually uh, also, you're expected to, make uh, take part in outreach projects to the overall community and you're expected to take some position in the more management side of the uh of the universities i, I recently took a, a position like that of course coordinator and you know, it, it's great that we have a, a lot of more contact with you know the undergrad students and we, we get to get them in the early stages of their careers and try to motivate and try to bring them to uh, actually learn more about whatever they're interested in learning. But uh, that's something that is extremely time consuming overall. And, and I, I lost count of how many hours I spent, you know, uh, writing logs of meetings because we have to open this kind of bureaucratic process somewhere. And that's, uh, that actually takes a lot of time. And uh, in, in, in Brazil, usually, uh, except for a few uh, specific places like uh, national, um, scientific Computing Laboratory or COPY at UFRJ, which is a, a research focus institution. Most are uh, teaching focused and research comes as a, a side project in a sense. It's, it's taken as a, a something extra. 
and it's really difficult to uh, properly concentrate on that when everything is so uh, your attention is, uh, is so um, divided in, in that sense and usually there's too little also uh, support staff to, to help with that process and the second point I think uh, probably also affects us kind of more than other countries probably, is that uh, our students, as they enter their undergrad years, they have uh, a really uh, hard uh, background in, in two senses in that usually their conditions to actually keep on their studies is, is harder than uh, you would expect or you would want them for them to be able to concentrate on, you know, acquiring new ideas and learning, I don't know, uh, computer architecture and calculus or whatever and also specifically there uh, the math uh, formation in math is, is also lacking when they enter right and, and uh, so they kind of enter already with sort of a fear of new knowledge especially in math but it, as in general they, they kind of try to do something with the knowledge they already have and it's difficult to actually get to the point where they are more open to uh, broadening their understanding of things uh, usually, usually they're trying to learn something that's more practical. They're oriented to what can I do with that? What can I, what can I build? What can I construct with that? Even in, in programming, we see that you know, it's easier for, for students to get motivated to learn, for example, a new framework for uh, writing some software than actually to develop more uh, back-end stuff and things like that. So I think that's a, a, a particular challenge in Brazil, but I'm, I'm not sure how, how other countries are uh, they face these challenges or if they are more prepared to deal with them. But uh, I, I think around here, it's, it's a really uh, heavy issue. So, so maybe if, if uh, even, even though we're here to listen to all of you, I'm going to, I think I'll summarize uh, at least certainly the comments in North America, because I've been a department chair and a dean and I'm an associate chancellor. So I see these things with uh, junior faculty all the time. So Jefferson, this, this thing about doing research, teaching, and service. Certainly here in North America, and I have a lot of friends in, in Asia and in the EU who are faculty members too, uh, that it's a lot of balls being juggled uh, in the air. One thing I hope, I'll, I'll just say this to all junior researchers and junior faculty, I, I hope your department, especially when you're getting started, can shield you from that a little bit. But, you know, as you go up, as you progress on, you're gonna be doing more and more of that, I think. Hopefully you can also keep the bureaucratic, uh, not so important work to a minimum. And hopefully your department can shield you from some of that. I, that's what I hope. I don't know what other people are, sorry, what the, the junior faculty here or junior researchers here are experiencing. Same thing? I, I, I would say that there's a, there's definitely a switching from being a researcher, being, um, you know, being a PhD student to being a junior faculty. There's certainly a, a new set of things that you start looking at teaching and, and service and um, writing grants being a, a few. But I do agree with Jim that I, I, I believe that the department that, I, that I'm in certainly is making efforts to, to shield me from a large number of things that probably I am, this is not the best time for me to be doing them. But at the same time, there's service things, which it is a good time for me to be doing those things, like being actively involved in hiring smart PhD students. It is, it is work I haven't done before, but it is work that is very important to me as I start out. And, that is something I, I do. So, so there's there's definitely a trade off here, and uh, I'm I'm certainly learning and taking advantage of mentorship in in the community to to figure out what I should be doing in terms of service and what maybe I should not be doing. So, um, yeah, maybe Mina Mina has more. Yeah, yeah, no, I just I want to say I have a similar experience that I think the juggling and the context switch has been the biggest challenge. I think just trying. Even if it's three things, like I, I feel like my attention is kind of pulled into ten different directions uh, yeah. every day, and it's it's you know it's something to get used to, and I think learning how to manage, and I think I'm definitely trying to get help from mentors, figuring that out. But I've been um, very lucky about, I mean, so far with the department, I feel like I've felt that support of, uh, you know, 
I, I do service, but it's more kind of uh, lighter service, you know, lighter committees, um, you know, student recruiting, you know, there's uh, a good number of staff and committees that, that you know, kind of help with that. Um, the grant writing, everything, I feel like I, I feel like I have the support uh, to kind of ease into it as much as possible. But I think at some point, just uh, nobody can take away the fact that you, you definitely have to juggle things and, you know, uh, got to have to learn that, I guess, uh, with some pain uh, over the next few years. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you for call... raising. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, say, I just want to say, I think that, that's what we call the academic freedom, or at least the cost of it, right? <laughs> yeah. So one I, comment I, 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 I have, to... uh, Jim, uh, 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 so it's like, uh, can we do better here in the sense there are public like cloud platforms and could we as a community you know, create more courses which could be leveraged uh, everywhere, right? So, so suppose, for example, here today we are five researchers working on related but somewhat different topics. Could we come up with a course, right, which could be used, leveraged at some other university? Um, talking about, you know, the ten big challenges that Mina was uh, initially referring to. So that would be great to have as advanced course, uh, which could be hosted on some cloud cloud platform and available freely to use across the globe. Yeah, but that, that would make a lot of lecturers redundant in universities where the funding for teaching comes from the students. And then uh, basically the first thing Chancellor would do is would fire the staff off and they're going to put on a higher bandwidth. No, I think I think the content, having the content is something. And I think lecturers bring a lot of value in actually knowing how to teach things. And I think that's one of the things that I feel like I didn't maybe learn too much as a researcher, which is there's so much research, it's so much new, so many new things about just how to teach effectively uh, to students. And I think lectures kind of focus on that and teaching faculty focus on that. Yeah. If you, you know, just have the content, they can bring that value. One thing just about content. So in 2020, Matt and I actually co-organized the SIGCOM workshop on, um, on education. I think it was the fourth in a series of SIGCOM uh, uh, workshops on education. And I think you find a lot of resources there, but I love the idea, Deva Palm, especially at the more advanced level, when you're thinking of graduate or second or third courses, graduate courses uh, in a field, collaborating on what ought to be a good curriculum. And my experience has been because I've co-taught courses with faculty in Brazil, universities love it. And I get full credit for teaching it, but I'm teaching with someone at FRJ and they get full credit teaching it and enjoy doing it together. So. Yeah, uh, I, I I wanted to make sure we got. There have been some questions that have it's come up in the Q and A, to... and so we want. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe we can take a question from the the Q and A. Um, one of the questions uh, is: uh, Can can you all describe uh, what are the prospects of networking research in the cloudification era? So as things become more cloud oriented, as you know, third parties run. You know their own backhaul networks. You know what? What are what are the prospects? How how does networking research change? You, do you all have any thoughts on that? Um, I, I I can say a little bit. Uh, my my I was working at uh, at Microsoft Azure for operators uh, less than two weeks ago. So um, and the the entire organization was uh, was trying to actually cloudify. Uh, network operators and and so so I, I completely see why this question is is on top of some of your minds. This is definitely something that's been happening for the past decade, and we are continuing to find new industries and spheres where cloud can make a difference and let people leverage the economy of scale and you know all of the good stuff that comes with with clouds. Uh, I think the the challenges that we need to double down on when in 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 the face of cloudification in different industries is. Are, are some of them are very classic. They are how do you share resources efficiently? How do you you know sort of uh, share the network, share the compute, share any of the hardware, software resources amongst these various different types of new tenants efficiently without any of them uh, facing the brunt of you know one person overutilizing these res resources. So all of these challenges that as a community we have been dealing with in the past are getting new and interesting twists. Uh, as new industries get cloudified, and I, I think that we we haven't quite solved them yet, and thinking about them as uh, is is an important challenge. Some certainly something that I do uh, in in my work, but I'll, I'll let others say more. 
very very interesting point uh, rachi so uh, let me quickly add to that so i think a lot of these cloud applications are siloed in some sense right so uh, it's very important that uh, we uh, try to right size the interface between the applications and the and the infrastructure so that as rachi was mentioning we could do resource management efficiently uh, so that could be something interesting to explore in the context of cloudifying uh, and and using networks underneath Okay, um, there was another question. Uh, and it has to, coming back, we were talking about conferences and what to do at conferences. So the question is, uh, I'm curious to hear what the panelists think about a recent CCR, ACM CCR uh, article from Scott Schinker, uh, who always writes interesting things, uh, where he talks about what we should uh, optimize our conferences for laying the intellectual foundations of the field rather than only featuring complete deployed production scale work. Um, what are your thoughts about how this impacts our field in general? Um, this has been something that I've been dealing with for a while now. Um, especially in systems community, we do have this tendency of being extremely critical uh, comments like but this is only simulation this is like, like not not new to any of us i guess uh we have hopefully not given it but i've heard it um i'm not sure what we can do with the culture but 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 the result of this culture is that now papers are all uh, looking uh, picture perfect and then you try to replicate the work um even though they have this stamp of replication and things doesn't work uh, and simply because we shy away from exposing ourselves in when we write the paper. That means if I'm to start a new, um, if I have a PhD student who is looking for a new topic and we have this amazing paper from um, Scott Schenker, uh, we never know what would be a follow-up of this paper. It's a great idea, but they didn't dare to say what was wrong with it. Um, in being afraid that the reviewers might just because there is no room for having an incomplete work. And this is what I see now becoming more of more and of a trend. But for example, what I like about uh, papers from Sandy Brangon from NYU is that very often, for example, at the end of the paper, they would say, hey, we have done this and that and the other thing. Um, but there is room for improvement. And there you go, you immediately know where the paper is lacking. So I guess we need a bit more of this culture. Um, paper I feel like a, a few other areas of um, computer science and engineering they, they do that a little bit more efficiently I mean uh, there's certainly uh, different ways for you to uh, constitute your paper write and publish in fields like uh, software engineering or databases and stuff like that so i think there's certainly room for uh, both kinds of, of papers but uh, i i in general i kind of agree with that uh, with that direction i think it's uh, uh, i think it's something that uh, is most directly useful to the research conductors themselves more than to the industry i think you know these uh things that you you essentially extract from the paper even if you're not directly working on that area but that can influence how you approach certain problems in other areas i think that's certainly very productive to have as at least one of the bases of um how we uh structure our papers and our conferences to to get everything published i think i think there's a positive direction as well I mean, I just want to add, I, I, I'm really glad that there was a CCR paper about this. I think it's getting the conversation started and there's something concrete, like a proposal that, you know, we can start iterating on. And I think it's it's great to start thinking about what are the foundations of our, uh, you know, like networking in general and, you know, what kind of uh, building systems is definitely very important, building those kind of end-to-end -end systems that work, uh, but also kind of going back to some of the fundamental questions that we want to kind of address as a community and, you know, uh, thinking about the intellectual directions, but I think we like we also need to be careful a little bit because you don't want to have I don't know the fundamental idea track and the system you know 
track and that, you know, people start thinking, oh, you know, papers in, you know, one track are going to be more valuable than the other. You know, I think we need to be careful about how we approach that. But I, but, but I really like the idea of trying to start a conversation at least about how to restructure the conference to try to make it more about ideas. And, and that's usually what it is in other fields, right? They have journals where there's like full, you know, published papers with a lot of details. And then conferences is a place where you actually exchange ideas and you think about new things. And, you know, there's not a focus on that full paper and the long talk more about, you know, exchanging of ideas. So I'm, I'm very looking forward to seeing that kind of change happen. A very brief comment here is that, you know, uh, uh, as a community, we do have these, um, you know, flagship hotnets like conference uh, workshop, right? So which will discuss more about new ideas, which would generate a series of papers and some of these papers would eventually go to conferences, find a home. So uh, it's not that bad, right? I mean, we could still discuss ideas and then some of these ideas would uh, see end-to-end -end systems happening after a while. Right. But I mean, hotnets is, is once a year, right? A few papers, <laughs> yeah. right? Like yeah. that hotnets is right. still very competitive, right? <laughs> in like very, very competitive. Workshop, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Um, we're going to have to uh, call a halt to the conversation here. It's been really, really great. And actually so many interesting things have come up that I'm hoping we're going to be able to continue these on the Slack channel. So uh, Stavrula, if you get a chance, could you just cut and paste the, or Matt, could you just cut and paste the uh, Slack um, URL so people can join, or if you've joined already, to continue the conversation there? Um, we really want to thank uh, all of our five panelists here for, for joining us, for sharing the thoughts, and, and just for all the great conversation that we had today. And um, we'll wish you the best in your careers also that are, that are starting now and, and, and well underway. Okay, so um, let me see. We want to do one last thing. We just want to, uh, in addition to thanking you again, we want to uh, just share what the next upcoming event is going to be for the networking channel. So let me share my screen. And okay. So two weeks from today, same time, uh, same channel as the saying goes. Um, we're going to have a discussion on navigating dual use harms in, in networking research. And we have uh, two people who've thought a lot about this um, uh, leading this discussion, Brian Levine at the University of Massachusetts and Nick Weaver uh, at UC Berkeley. So uh, thank you again, everybody here on our panel again for the participation. It was great. And we hope to see everybody again in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for the invitation. Great. Bye. Thanks again. See you. See you.